Welcome and good afternoon to all. We would like to respectfully acknowledge all Native American peoples who have lived on this land since time immemorial. TCU especially acknowledges and pays respect to the Wichita and affiliated tribes upon whose historical homeland our university is located. Once again, good afternoon to all. My name is Dr. Frederick Gooding Jr., AKA Dr. G, and I am chair of the TCU Race and Reconciliation Initiative. Our mission has simply uh, three components, and that is to study TCU's history and relationship with slavery, the Confederacy, and racism. Now, in the course of us studying our relationship with our history, we plan to produce a first year survey report that we plan to release with the TCU public and campus community on April 21st. That is coming up April 21st, otherwise known as Reconciliation Day. But in the meantime, what we wish to do is stay in contact, stay in community, and stay in conversation through opportunities like these, where we're simply opening up various spaces so that various members of our community can come together and understand what larger ideas of reconciliation are about. Now, mind you, we are an academically based, historically focused initiative. So therefore, any questions outside of our, our area of expertise will simply be forwarded to the appropriate parties. And um, in, in total, uh, what we want to do is uh, simply um, move forward with a discussion that will hopefully help people gain perspective um, and deepen the understanding about what reconciliation means to them. Um, as we are still looking to hammer out what reconciliation means to all of us as a collective unit. And so today, I am very much pleased and privileged to introduce the Dean of the College of Education who will introduce our guest speaker who will talk about some of these larger ideas. And, uh, and in case you haven't had the opportunity to meet this individual, uh, I will only allow COVID as an excuse, right? You know, based upon our disconnected campus. But you definitely wanna make time to get to notice newly installed the Dean of the College of Education because prior to uh, the work at TCU, uh, Dr. Hernandez served as Associate Dean and Harold and Annette Simmons Endowed Chair in Educational Policy and Leadership at the Simmons School of Education at Southern Methodist, Southern Methodist University. So um, we're getting the best of the DFW area, right, right here. Okay, so prior to that, Dr. Hernandez served as the Dean of the College of Education at the University of Texas of the Permian Basin in Odessa, Texas. And Dr. Hernandez's research work has focused on four areas of inquiry, Latinos in school leadership, Latino racial identity development, inclusive leadership for LGBTQ students, and leadership for social justice. He has published extensively on Latino leadership, including two books, Abriendo Puertas y Cerrando Aridas, which essentially means opening doors and closing wounds, and um, Latinas, Latinos, Finding Work-Life Balance in Academia with Elizabeth Mura, Murakimi and Gloria Rodriguez. And Brown-Eyed Leaders of the Sun, a portrait of Latina, Latino educational leaders le with Elizabeth Murakami as well. I'm not done. Dr. Hernandez is a founding member of Deans for Impact. Check it out an organization focused on transforming educator preparation and elevating the teaching profession. Dr. Hernandez is a graduate of the 2016 class of Presidential Leadership Scholars, right? An initiative that draws upon US Presidential Centers of Lyndon B. Johnson, George H.W. Bush, William Jefferson Clinton, and George W. Bush. He's a 2014 graduate of the Millennium Leadership Initiative. He serves as an associate editor for the Journal of Leadership and Dr. Hernandez received his PhD in Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I desperately need a glass of water after this mouthful. This is you know, an extremely accomplished individual who we're so very fortunate to have in our midst and in our circle, and I'm so very fortunate that he's taken an interest in you know, serving as a you know, mentor, leader for our uh, upcoming scholar, Esti Hernandez, who will soon now introduce. Dr. Hernandez, thank you for welcoming, for coming into this space. Thank you very much, Dr. G, for that introduction. Everyone in the College of Education is thrilled to partner with the inaugural Race and Reconciliation Initiative here at TCU for today's event. 
Before I introduce our speaker, please allow me a minute or two to highlight a few of our DEI efforts. First, I would like to thank Dr. Sue Anderson and Dr. India Lindo for serving as college diversity advocates for the College of Education. With their leadership, we have focused our attention on a few goals. One is to advocate for equity and inclusion within the campus, our classrooms, schools, and the community and beyond. Another goal is to prepare our students to work in diverse educational settings. We've also worked at promoting and supporting the enhanced recruitment of underrepresented students, faculty, and staff, and to offer sustainable DEI programs that provide learning opportunities for students, faculty, staff, and community, and a goal that provides processes for the voices of COE students, faculty, and staff to be heard regarding issues of DEI so that members of the CEO community are included, respected, and valued. While we have a number of ongoing efforts and events that support these goals, our conversations in the college are now related to how to best assess or collect data about how well we're doing in meeting these goals. However, we wanna do this assessment and data collection work appropriately so that we can make informed decisions and reflect the true diversity of the communities in which we serve. We want this work to be more than just about numbers. We want our assessment and data collection to be an opportunity to listen and to understand the stories and experiences of the individuals we seek to serve. We also know that how we collect data reflects the college's values. And we also know this work can either unintentionally reinforce harmful stereotypes and perpetuate inequalities and bias, or it can strive to promote inclusion and equity. So if you're interested in being a thought partner with us in the College of Education around how to best do this work around assessing and collecting data around DEI initiatives, we'd love for you to reach out to one of our college diversity advocates or reach out to me directly, and we'd love to engage you in this conversation. Now, it gives me great pride to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Esti Hernandez earned her PhD in higher education from Florida State University and a master's in higher education and student affairs and a bachelor's in French from Baylor University. She and her family immigrated from Mexico when she was a young girl and she's deeply proud of being a Valley girl from Brownsville, Texas. Dr. Hernandez's research broadly engages academic socialization experiences among minoritized populations with a focus on Black and Chicanas in graduate study. Specifically, she's interested in the way in which racism, sexism, and other forms of oppression are entrenched in higher education policies and practices. Her dissertation focused on the way in which Chicana doctoral students who aspire to the professorate embody a scholar activist identity. The second prong of this research is how this identity is disembodied on social media. She's currently working on a book to honor these testimonials and will share them with the broader audience soon. Please join me in welcoming our speaker this afternoon, Dr. Essie Hernandez. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Hernandez. We were prior to this um, webinar, we're just talking about how we are probably related. What are the odds that there would be two Hernandezes in this webinar? Um, and we actually have similar family ties in the same geographic area of the Valley. And so afterwards we're going to investigate whether or not we actually are related, um, which wouldn't surprise me. Um, if you would, if the host would allow me to share my screen, please, so that I may share my PowerPoint deck. Perfect.
Thank you all so much for joining me for this conversation, this town hall that I've entitled Race Neutral Policies as Barriers to Reconciliation. The quotations are intentional as you might have presumed because I am really thinking about the ways we say that we're being race neutral, but in reality, we very much are not, right? Um, I. First, before I begin my lecturette, would like to acknowledge that I identify as a Chicana feminist. What does this mean, right? It means that everything that I am and everything that I do is situated from this particular vantage point, one. But two, it also calls attention to, or rather I, I am committed to calling attention to racism, to sexism, to sex heteronormativity, to coloniality. Um, in everything that we do, both in higher education, but recognizing that higher education is kind of a microcosm of our society writ large, right? And so I'm committed to really bringing voice and to um, uplifting these stories and these policies. It's almost like a pair of glasses that I wear that I, you know, for those of us who wear glasses, if I don't wear them, I can't see anything, right? Well, Chicana feminism, is the pair of glasses through which I see the world. And so that's something that's really central to who I am and my practice. And you, I hope it permeates, it's the thread that permeates through this entire lecturette. I also want to acknowledge that I am a storyteller by training and by ancestry is what I'd like to say. What else does that mean, right? It means that one, I was trained as a qualitative scholar, right? Um, and but also recognizing that qualitative scholarship has existed for eons and eons far before we called it qualitative research, right? Um, the process of systematic inquiry, of observing, of understanding, of being and participating in the world is an ancestral practice that has been transmitted intergenerationally. I think about the ways that my family members have shared and have been sharing stories to communicate knowledge for time immemorial, right? And I've just been the benefactor of mentoring and advising that has helped me to position my storytelling in a way that is valuable to academic actors, right? It's, it's my job, right? Um, but it's something that is a time honored practice that is part of who I am in my family history. And so I wanted to offer this context so you know a little bit about who I am and my approach to this work. Again, this is a little bit of just like a lecturette, but at the end, want to open the floor for questions and answers, like a true town hall for folks to ask questions and to pose their own thoughts so that we can continue to dialogue about this important conversation. So first and foremost, why is racism so hard to tackle? Um, I think primarily, no, I know that we tend to see racism as individual acts of meanness, right? As opposed to seeing it as a larger system that permeates every part of our society. Um, it is, I wouldn't say through no fault of our own necessarily, but it is the way that we have been socially conditioned through the people that have had influence on our lives, our family members, our, communities of which we are a part, for instance, church communities, faith communities, um, families, um, institutions, just like higher education, but sometimes teams, if we were athletes in a past life or continue to identify as such, all of these communities commun uh, communicate and inform and socializes into a particular way of being and in ways that are not neutral, right? And so we, but yet we think about racism as individual things that people say, right? And therefore, if we don't say these racist things, then we are, that ourselves are not racist, right? People who say these things are racist. So one, this results in us policing and self-policing our words, right? We deflect as it's PC, politically correct, right? But yet, if we ourselves say something that may be not PC, um, we immediately take offense and get defensive about what we say, right? Because we do not want to be seen as racist, right? But if we are careful and we don't say things that are racist, that means that we don't have to do anything else, right? We are done with our work here, right? We are good 
And yet somehow, if we ourselves aren't racist, the people that we surround ourselves with are not racist. Why is it that racism persists, right? And you can see how quickly this argument of racism as individual acts of meanness unravels, right? Because if we ourselves are not racist and racism still persists, there's an incongruency there, right? I think about the ways that we enact higher education policy in here, that is my discipline, right? Higher education. And, but I'm sure this applies to most other workspaces. And I would encourage you as you're reading the quote on the screen to reflect on your own spaces. I am a huge fan of Sarah Ahmed. Um, and I have a slide at the end of resources that you may continue to, uh, that you may approach for continued learning. But Sarah Ahmed as a scholar interrogates conventional diversity policy as one that is primarily focused on heterogeneity, i.e. just cultural plurality, just diverse bodies just ambling about in a space without necessarily thinking about the ways that policies are very much innate in our institutions. And so she talks about how when we invite diverse bodies into these spaces, we expect them, we expect, we are expected for those of us who are of color, are expected to remain silent, right? We have been invited to the space, we should be grateful and we should keep working and sustain the status quo. And so this particular quote refers to um, the ways that we are expected to behave and conform to higher education. She says to be in this world is to be involved with things in such a way that they recede from consciousness. When things become institutional, they recede. To institutionalize X is for X to become routine or ordinary, such that X becomes part of the background for those who are part of an institution, right? And so as diverse people, as people of color, as institutional actors, we are asked to recede to the background. But for many of us for whom we cannot leave our identities at the door, they are very much central to who we are and what our values are. To ask to leave who we are at the door is impossible. So what happens to us if we are unable to recede to the background, right? And so I wanna call attention to whiteness and white supremacy while I drink some water. Um, I think that folks, by and large, if you say white supremacy um, or even whiteness, they get a little bit befuddled or tense because I think we are con we conventionally use white supremacy to um, explain or to refer to common um, common white supremacist organizations. Well, I wouldn't say common, but like the KKK, for example or the Proud Boys. We name and see those organizations as white supremacy, white supremacist, okay, fair. But when I say white supremacy here, I'm not necessarily referring to what we would probably say are obvious examples of white supremacy. What I'm saying here as white supremacy, are, I'm referring to the all encompassing dimensions of whiteness and white privilege, white dominance and assumed superiority in society. In other words, I'm referring to the norms that are very much woven into the fabric of higher education. Um, and I also want to call attention to the fact that one does not have to be white to uphold whiteness and white supremacy, right? Um, and I also want to call attention to the fact that whiteness itself is a property of value, as Cheryl Harris um, has connoted in her infamous essay, that not only are these norms very much part of who we are, but in order to persist or in order to recede to the background, so to speak, as Sarah Ahmed has posed in the previous slide, is to accrue this property, if you will, to get this property and to promote it and to continue to distribute it as such. Um, I want to call attention to the fact that higher education in and of itself is an exclusive enterprise, right? We 
um, admit students, right? They don't just walk in through our doors. They have to be able to pay tuition, right? And without that, they would also not be admitted to our organizations, right? It's not all open, free, um, everyone is admitted, right? And so by its very design, higher education is exclusive, right? But historically, higher education has always been exclusive. In fact, you know, John Thielen, the preeminent uh, higher education history scholar in his canonical text on higher education history notes that it was created for, you know, privileged white men who could afford to leave their homes that didn't have to maintain homes or farms and were intending to be part of the clergy, right? Um, we think about our histories of having to form HBCUs by the very fact that education was segregated. We think about um, a racist um, boarding schools that were created to effectively engage in cultural genocide of native populations, right? And just the ways that education has been, has created very intentional and intergenerational harm, right? And so while I think we do our best to um, recognize this history. I believe that this is what our, our eye, the practice that we are engaged in right now is to call attention to this history and to reckon with it. It is important that we name it, right? And recognize that it is very much part of the fabric of who we are. Um, and in doing so, we can work through it, process it, what it means so that we can move forward. But beyond historical artifacts, I also want to call attention to the ways that whiteness is normed in everyday life. I, um, to adhere to whiteness is number one, is an unwillingness to name the contours of racism. And what I mean by that is, again, we see racism as individual instances of race without necessarily thinking about the multifaceted ways that racism permeates our society and our decision making, the ways that we codify racism and maybe conflate it with social class, the ways we conflate it with merit, the ways we conflate it with um, perceived aptitude, and um, we don't necessarily notice it or it's such a part of who we are that we continue to behave as if nothing is happening, right? The second way in which we adhere to whiteness is the avoidance of identifying with the racial experience or with a group. Too often we um, think that race is a problem of people of color without and white people therefore are absolved from having to contend with race when truly whiteness in and of itself is very much central to the problem of race, right? And we all have to recognize the ways that we are ourselves complicit in this enterprise. And then finally, which I think is the charge of RRI, is to recognize the ways we have minimized racist legacies and to bring them to the forefront so that we may recognize the patterns that we are still perpetuating in everyday life experiences that have been very much marked historically, not just in higher education, but in our broader society. If you hear any bells right now, it's because my cats are fighting and they do not know that I'm currently giving a lecturette and they also do not care. And so that is why you hear bells in the background. <laughs> Take a water break. At the same time, I feel that and have noticed that in our strict adherence to a systems approach of racism or a regard of racism as a system systematic and systemic issue, we fail to acknowledge our perhaps willful, perhaps not, perhaps unknowing participation in, a, in this system and therefore absolving ourselves of any responsibility of doing anything about it. We say that we um, cannot because of our unique positions in such spaces, right? And we say that we um, perhaps cannot do anything about it, but fail to recognize our agency in these spaces, right? Um, I, when my work with students, for instance, as I teach in the John B. Roach Honors College, as well as in CRESS or Comparative Race and Ethnic Studies, I very much empower students to consider the ways they're able to enact 
change right now from where they stand. Because if we think about systems as these large encompassing things in which we have no power, we feel to we make ourselves small. And instead I encourage everyone to think about the systems that are much smaller, that are much more accessible, that are, we are a part of every day. Um, with students, I talk about it as exec boards. I talk about it in terms of families, in terms of circles of friends, anywhere in any space where they have influence. And so I would encourage folks who are participating today to think about what are the smallest systems that we are a part of in which we have influence and where we can enact agency towards calling attention to the ways that the racism is very much part of these systems and what we can do about it, right? We as, as faculty might say, well, I don't have tenure yet. Um, I, my situation in the academy is precarious. Or if we are administrators in higher education, we might think, well, I'm simply a coordinator or I'm a paraprofessional, right? Um, I will wait until I have a full-time job or I'll wait until I'm a mid-level manager in order to enact change. But there will always be something else, right? There will always be something bigger than us. Um, if once we get tenure, then we will have to think about whether or not we want full professorship or if we want to be a department chair, and so we have to act carefully, right? Or But once we're there, maybe we're thinking about the deanship, right? And then once we're there, we're thinking about the VP level or, you know, the chancellor presidential level. Um, I think about accrediting boards. There will always be something else that we answer to. There are so many constituents in these complex organizations that we have to consider. There will always be something else. So instead of thinking about it from these large, massive systems, instead thinking about what is the change that I can enact now, right? And what is my mandate? at this current time. And so with that, I would like to conclude with this question of to whom are we accountable? I think about Lee Patel um, in her work on decolonizing educational research and how we, and she calls it answerability, right? As researchers, um, we, are ex we are engaged in a very extractive enterprise that very much replicates coloniality, right? We take from participants, so to speak, and we often fail to consider feedback loops, right? Going back to the communities that we have extracted from and um, working alongside them to enact change based on the knowledges that they have and have provided us willingly, right? Um, we think about our research as a means to an end perhaps so that we can advance in the academy without necessarily thinking about our responsibility to these communities. Right. Um, at the same time, we think about the academy again as a system, as a, with a, kind of like anthropomorphizing the academy, so to speak, with, um, without considering that the academy itself is not a person. Right. It is filled with actors, uh, ourselves being an actor in it. Right. And so instead of thinking about um, our scholarship as a means to an end, in what ways are we really working alongside communities? And so I would venture to say we aren't answerable to the academy. Certainly I as an instructor have signed a contract that says that I will meet certain deliverables with students, right? That I will submit grades at the end of the semester. But at the same time, I know that that's not what it's about. I'm not accountable to this minutia. I'm accountable to the students that I work alongside. I am accountable to the communities that I say that are important to me. I am accountable to um, this larger work, this larger enterprise of what it means to be truly inclusive. Um, I think about how my mom, uh, every time I reached a significant milestone in my life, um, she would always say that I couldn't have fathomed in Spanish, because my mom speaks Spanish primarily, she couldn't have fathomed her little girl going off to college, she couldn't have fathomed her little girl studying abroad, earning a master's degree, um, earning a doctorate, becoming a professor, right? By and large, my mom doesn't know exactly what it is that I do, but she knows what a professor is, right? Um, and so, my family and I emigrated from Mexico when I was very young, right? Because my parents sought opportunities for me and for my siblings and they themselves are not formally educated. They haven't moved past beyond a middle school education. And so, yes, um, I do occupy precarious spot, a, a precarious position in the academy in that, you know, I am um, 
uh, employed at will as, as, a, as an adjunct professor, certainly. Um, I continue to be um, a woman of color in this space, a queer woman of color in these spaces. Yet at the same time, I have to remember that my family could have never ever um, fathom these spaces for me. I have to remember that something like one in three people in the United States has a higher education degree, right? And so with these privileges come tremendous responsibility to do right by the communities from where we come, the communities that we intend to serve. And so I would encourage attendees to really think about um, to whom are we really accountable, right? And um, in the work that we are doing, how can we shift intentionally so that we become more honorable to these communities that are so important to us. I finally conclude with some resources um, for continued learning, um, you know, including the Sarah Ahmed text that I quoted earlier, but some other works that may inform our practices as educators, as scholars, and then some articles that are really canon and helpful as we in think about interrupting microaggressions and interrupting whiteness in our workspaces. With that, I will stop sharing my screen and invite people. Um, I don't know exactly if I am fielding questions no. or if no. others are. Um, yeah, so first of all, Dr. Hernandez, uh, thank you uh, for that. And thank you for the list of resources as well. Um, I think um, that'll be very helpful. Maybe we can figure out a way to uh, still disseminate that information um, through our website. But mm -hmm. for now, while we have you, what we want to do is, um, you know, interact as much as possible. So uh, I have a couple of follow-up questions. In the meantime, if anyone's watching or listening, um, feel free to submit uh, your question through the, the Q&A um, you know, portion that, that should be available at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And our graduate research assistant one time, Mr. Marcellus Perkins, will curate those questions so we can uh, tee those up. So in terms of the title of the presentation, uh, Dr. Mendez, like, again, I'd like to go first. Um, when we say race neutral policies, are you suggesting that the system as a whole is able to continue with this behavior and operation, which often has detrimental effects for black indigenous people of color because individually people see themselves as innocent. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to clarify, you know, how these race neutral policies end up being passed and how they end up affecting us. Yes, the answer to your question is yes. Uh, I do think that we see often see ourselves as innocent bystanders in this enterprise. We see that we are exclusive, but yet we don't see the ways in which we are agentic actors that are able to um, push back and to change the ways we do things fundamentally. Certainly we may not have the power to change things from the top down, but we can enact change from the bottom up right, in the everyday, in the things that we do. And I wanna call attention to the fact that the norms, the policies, the practices, um, from the very, the granular things that we do as educators are very much tied to white norms that we have failed to acknowledge, that we maybe haven't thought about, um, or that we have normed, whether willingly or unwillingly or unknowingly. And so that's what I wanna call attention to the ways that the norms that we enact every day are causing harm to ourselves, to our students, um, and especially in light of ongoing violence that I think about um, towards uh, black communities in particular, um, but towards other communities that are maybe not as salient to us. Okay, because okay, because it gets normed. Okay, th that's very helpful. Um, and along those lines, uh, Melissa uh, would like to know, how do we institute, I guess, this, um, you know, the, the, this critical thinking about, you know, the race neutral at the lower educational level? I mean, as you know, you've heard the argument about how, you know, our youth are so tender, right, at, at that stage in life, and we don't want to burden them, you know, with the exigencies of the frictions and the, the nastiness of racism. So there's that argument out there that kids are too young. And, and so therefore maybe we as educators should wait until middle school and, 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 allow, <laughs> and allow for the middle school educators to figure it out. I'm being a little facetious, but to, to, in answer to Melissa's question, 
what would be your response as far as how to go about it at the lower education level? Um, I think there are many ways. I immediately think about the ways that we have engaged in teacher preparation or administrative preparation that work to erase the cultural forms of knowledge that have gotten us to where we are um, and yet has undervalued them. I think about how um, for me and my family, the importance of prayer and the multifaceted ways that prayer actually manifests, right? Um, and yet we don't necessarily talk about, obviously permitting, maybe that wasn't the most, the greatest example, but I think about the cultural forms of knowledges that we have carried with us that we undermine and invalidate in education from the very beginning. And so I think about for teachers, especially in the classroom, for instance, um, in what ways can we interrupt the ways that we have been prepared as teachers and validate students when they bring forth their forms of cultural knowledge and affirm them, right? Just as you said, Dr. G, the children are impressionable, they're malleable, they're little, they're sponges, right? I think about how important the work of primary education, elementary education um, teachers are, is because they absorb everything and it's such a pivotal time in their development. What are the ways that we can affirm these forms of knowledge that students bring to the table, support them and love them in ways that they deserve and thereby challenge the ways that we have been normed to think about knowledge. Um, all right, but, but, all right, but Dr. Hernandez, I gotta jump in. This sounds really great if you're starting a Montessori school. Right? I don't actually, I, 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 not no, necessarily. I think- No, 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 seriously. I mean, cause when you talk about, we're going to affirm each individual student Okay, that sounds really great, but I mean, I guess the question is, okay, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I mean, it sounds great, but I'm just asking practically, when so many teachers feel pressure mm -hmm. to fulfill certain standards, mm -hmm. where is there quote unquote room or time for teachers on the fly to take in this new information and affirm, right, what students are bringing into the classroom? I mean, that, that's what I'm trying to get at, right? You know, mm -hmm. with this child directed and it's in a format where I get paid to just focus on what Johnny wants to do this day, you know, that's another matter. But when you're talking about a large classroom and there's a lot going on, where do I have time and space to affirm students and what they bring into the classroom? I'm thinking about the inner intermittent ways that we affirm students, but I'm also thinking about the ways that as teachers, yes, you are answerable to the policies or tests or administrators and those demands, but you also have agency in lesson plans, in outcomes, in texts that children read, right? And so you have um, some, some uh, flexibility in being able to um, actually deliver these deliverables. Right. And so I would encourage educators to really think about the ways that the text that students are reading, the lessons and the outcomes that we are thinking about and what are the ways that we can engage in culturally validating and culturally congruent practices that interrupt these norms. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it, I was thinking about the one on one kind of interactions and conversations you have with students, but mm -hmm. systematically speaking, we have agency over those things. And so what can we do in order to do that in our classrooms? Okay, okay. Uh, you know, you should coin that phrase, culturally congruent. You know, that, oh, that, it's, that, I that, didn't that, point that, it there. <laughs> it exists educational research. Um, <laughs> uh, we also, um, we have an anonymous attendee who'd like to know, what's an example of a race neutral policy here at TCU that tangibly harms TC students? And along those lines, what would a race conscious alternative be? Um, I do not have the benefit of working as an administrator, right? Um, I have worked at probably about five different institutions of higher education of different types. And so I can't necessarily speak to a TCU specific policy as my purview is in the classroom, so to speak. Um, you might have to think about it more, but I think about like organizational policies that, um, like student organizational policies that may impinge upon students and cause harm. For instance, while I recognize that there are a minimum number of members and required to register a student organization, if we are thinking about how can we be inclusive to 
I don't know, let's say Native American student, and we think about the, the tiny, tiny decimal points that we have of Native students here on campus, if we don't have enough students to even create this registered student organization because they don't meet the minimum number of members required, then in what ways are we excluding these organizations and inhibiting them from even existing? Um, so I think about how policies intended to um, promote retention, you know, like we think about like, okay, well, minimum number of registered student organization members makes sense because we don't want any one student to take on too much responsibility, yada, yada. But it's like, well, if we have five native students enrolled on campus and the minimum requirement is 10 students to create a student org, and where does that leave us, right? And so I would really encourage um, practitioners to think about how these policies that we promote as race neutral, like, this you know, minimum number of members, for example, um, can create harm and inhibit opportunities for students to connect and to really feel that they belong at our university. Um, I, I think as an educator, I have been increasingly sensitive in this time of a pandemic in thinking about um, what kind, what the outcomes of this pandemic have been for students who are in caretaking roles. This doesn't necessarily have to do with race, although it can. Um, students that are in caretaking roles, students that are required to work because they are not necessarily essential workers, but perhaps they're working in like fast food or things like that. And their schedules are different because you know, somebody um, contracted the virus and therefore they asked them to come in late and yada, yada. How are we being sensitive to students who have increasing demands on their time and who are feeling the weight of the pandemic in ways that are sensitive to their needs? I think many of us have carried on this language of, well, the pandemic's been going on for a year. And so any problems that you've had at the onset of the pandemic should have been resolved by now. Like any excuses that you might have are kind of null and void at this point. You should have already kind of, you know, receded to the mean, so to speak. You should have already kind of gotten the hang of it, right? Um, when that may not necessarily be true um, of all of our students. And so I think about what are the ways that we can be more sensitive to the needs of students, especially at this time. You know, and what you say about this idea of being uh, sympathetic um, really resonates with me when I think about within the K through 12 dynamic, the amazing as it is alarming statistics about how black and brown um, students are suspended and expelled at disproportionate rates, right? You know, and I think that a lot of this stems from these issues of empathy that you're talking about. I mean, you figure kids are what? Kids, right? And so, if you tell Sally to sit down, you know, sometimes Sally may not feel like sitting down, right? You know, or, or just understand the importance of why she has to sit down along with everybody else. So, um, but we've seen this where the teacher will ask Sally, who's white, you know, to sit down and Sally won't sit down and the teacher will redirect, but Sally, all of our friends are waiting, you know, the teacher will redirect again. So are you sure Sally, you know, appeal to conscience, oh, you know, all, the, all these measures, right? Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, Roberto or Malik, what, what you, you're not going to sit down? Okay, off to the principal's office. We're done. You know, you know, I need to move on with this classroom. We have to move on. You're holding everybody up. You know, game over. Like, what? Now, all of a sudden, Roberto or Malik is in trouble, right? You know, and, 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 you know, and then, the, you know, there's this downward spiral from there. So this idea of sympathy and empathy, I think, is very, very, very important. And the question is, how do we systemically go about promoting that, right? Um, how do we go about promoting that? systemically. Um, so um, along those lines, um, Miriam uh, Azani, um, who's been doing some phenomenal work that you may have read about in TC Today, by the way, uh, asks, um, you know, particularly for those who work within the science fields, STEM, there's this idea, overarching narrative that it is just about the facts, right? You know, mm -hmm. it is just about the facts. It's, it's, just, it's just science. Mm -hmm. So there's really not going by what I was saying earlier, time or space for us to contemplate the, you know, these other social issues regarding, you know, the human condition. And so um, what are your thoughts on those who teach within the hard sciences, um, math or physics, with, especially within K through 12, um, what, what recommendations do you have for them? Because you did give us some good suggestions on how 
uh, the creative mind can still leverage spaces on making an impact. And you said agentic type, um, you know, um, you know, behaviors. How can that be done in the math and sciences fields? Um, I would push back on the idea that hard sciences are race neutral um, because they're not. Um, I think about my little sister who, when she was younger, she struggled with math. And I mean, there's multifaceted reasons why she felt that she struggled with math. And I would remind her, our people invented the zero. <laughs> like I think about indigenous communities, uh, particularly Aztecs are attributed to having um, created the zero, right? Like we can't be mad at bad at math. We created the zero. And she's like, yeah, you're right, right. And she wait, would- wait, wait, wait. When you say we created the zero, can you like elaborate on that just a little bit? Oh, I, I offer that as a colloquialism, right? But like, I'm not, like, I don't have a list of citations, right? But colloquially, we talk about how um, the Aztec culture was were really advanced with math. I think we think about how native cultures must have been primitive and um, colonization civilized natives, right? But in reality, natives were very civilized, right? And were very smart. And so I think about how, um, yeah, we say like, oh, ask the, Aztec natives created the zero, right? Just like, oh, we created the zero. Our people created, our ancestors created the zero, right? And so those are the kinds of knowledges that we erase conveniently or we don't necessarily think about and therefore we don't reproduce, right? And so um, math is not race neutral. Um, STEM is not race neutral, right? I think we have a responsibility as educators to think about where these forms of knowledge just come from, right? Um, it is all situated in society and culture and history, right? And yes, we are not, I don't know that teacher preparation programs really encourage that. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I, that's not, I'm not K through 12 educator, I'm a higher education educator, um, but I would encourage educators in fact to really think about cultural underpinnings of these forms of knowledge, right? And where they come from, because they're very much situated in history and culture in society, right? And to draw examples and to draw and amplify those cultural forms of knowledge in the classroom when they are advancing these, um, these lectures, these assignments, et cetera. Um, I don't, I think we get, the other thing is that we get defensive when we're told to, ch to change our, um, our delivery, our approach is, our approaches. I think we think that um, we take it as like a, a an attack on our character, right? When it's really just a, a suggestion, right? And so I would encourage others to really think about, and this is not specific to educators, but more just as people, like what is our reaction when someone asks, you know, calls attention to something that we did that was potentially harmful or something that we could do that could be better, right? If our reaction is defensive, it's really worth thinking about what is it about what this person is saying that's making me defensive? Why am I triggered by this, right? And what does that reveal about me and who I am? And what can I do to move forward? Um, but that's really just thinking about how triggers are, are an opportunity to learn and grow, but uh, okay. yes. Okay, so I'd like to bring in um, at this moment our graduate wonder kind um, research assistant. When we talk about education. Um, also uh, um, a graduate student within our um, higher education uh, program. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's just only appropriate, um, you know, it's been long overdue, you know, that, that we bring in Mr. Marcellus Perkins, uh, you know, to the mix. Could also like to ask a question. Um, but um, again, I, I really think what you're saying is, 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 very, is very good in terms of, even this very notion that STEM is race neutral, <laughs> we should challenge that at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Just, just that idea. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, I'll, I'll like to take leave. And um, Ms. Perkins, you said you would like to jump in there. Absolutely, thank you, Dr. G. Um, as like you said, my name is Marcellus Perkins. Uh, my last semester of the Master of Higher Education program, college education. Um, I come as one, but I stand as ten thousand. I can because they did. Um, so the question that I have for you is very tangible, how might we be able to interrupt whiteness or white supremacy here at TCU? Um, and I asked that question because I feel as though for a lot of students of color, faculty staff of color, we understand the system in which we're operating. In. We understand the demographics of, of TCU. We understand TCU's history. We understand TCU's uh, social economic status and identity, even through the lens of the Fort Worth community outside. But how can we interrupt it here and in our day-to-day. -day. Um, you, you mentioned about um, who are we accountable to? 
and that that in some ways lends itself to the answer in which we seek. But kind of building upon that, how might we interrupt it every day or, or, or even in a, in a small matter, just so people can take away something and understand like, this is what I can do and this is what I'm accountable for and to. Um, thank you. I think that that's an important question. Um, I think, and I'd like to remind students that um, your simple presence, our simple presence in these institutions is an interruption, right? Um, because our bodies and selves are like a, an interruption of that norm, like our visible presences are an interruption of these norms, right? And so I want to encourage, especially students who might think like, I'm not doing enough, you're, you as a person, as a human are enough right? And you're doing the very best you can. I think about how students, um, so often we ask students to recall and retell instances of trauma in this institution. I think about students who have admitted that they hadn't heard the N-word being told them to them to their faces until they got here, right? Mm -hmm. And how in retelling these stories, you are reliving these traumatic experiences. And I like to remind students that you're not here to educate, you're here to receive an education, right? Um, you are a client, so to speak, right? And so you are not charged with doing that unless you want to, right? And we thank you for that service. Um, at the same time, I would like to remind students that they um, are agents also. You can also act from where you stand by interrupting a microaggression, whether it be from a fellow student or a professor. If you don't feel that you can necessarily interrupt at that moment, perhaps sending an email. If a professor is not receptive to said email, um, uh, submitting reports, um, at the, whether it is through a bias reporting system at the university or it is through um, what a lot of students like to do is to post about it on social media because that gains more immediate traction, right? Um, and to effectively testify on social media about the experiences that you have. That's really powerful, right? But I also think about how um, in student organizations, we perpetuate white norms. Like I think about how Robert's rules, you know, if, if for those of us who are members of Greek letter organizations, um, are very much entrenched in white norms, right? Like, do we have to use Robert's rules? Maybe not, right? Um, and so um, I think about the structure of dues and how that um, these due structures, while I recognize that we have that they are allotted to certain things, may exclude students who are from low socioeconomic families. So if we have to in indeed accept, you know, take dues, like what can we do to su supplement? so that a member is not closed off from an opportunity to join such organization, right? Um, I think about how um, students are able to coalesce and build coalitions across these differences. I think too much, often we are siloed, but together we are powerful. And so I would encourage students to continue to build coalitions so that we can advocate for change, um, whether it's student organization policy or institutional policy, because students are powerful. Um, and we answer to you. So I would encourage you to um, seek out the experiences that you want. Thank you. Uh, I have another question um, from Dr. Pinon. Uh, to what extent is admissions to CCU based on qualifying characteristics, a race neutral policy, uh, i.e. that TCU has mostly white students is intentionally supported by official policy? Thank you for the question. Yeah, and, and just to add on to Dr. Pinon's question, this idea of what do you think SAT scores truly reflect? Uh, I believe you and I had a conversation about this earlier. Um, I think that there's substantial evidence by way of educational research and policy to affirm and confirm that SAT tests are biased, right? And so increasingly there are institutions who are doing away with SAT, SAT, et cetera, as a requirement for admission. I think that that's a direction that we could take. Um, but I think it's worth really thinking about like, why do we have admissions the way that we do? And I think too often we say, well, we've always done it that way, right? Why do we have to change it? It works. But if we are not seeing um, the student population really reflecting what we want, then maybe it kind of starts there, right? I'm not saying I have any answers. I would really have to like work in partnership with admissions and really think about, you know, I myself have not applied to TCU, so I don't know exactly what the date, like what it looks like, right? But it's worth thinking about like, 
what are the questions that we're asking and in what ways do we think they're race neutral, but are they not, right? In thinking about like prompts for essays, right? Like what are the ways in which we can help students who might not otherwise see themselves at TCU and open those doors for them, whether it's through college fairs at um, Title I institutions, right? Um, and increasing our support for programs like community scholars, et cetera. Um, but again, that would involve a little bit more work on my part, but it's really thinking about like, if the status quo is not working, then we need to change the status quo. Absolutely. You know, uh, it, it, oh, I was gonna say, oh, go ahead, Ms. Perkins, go ahead. I was going to just squeeze in uh, just one more question in due time. But I, oh, okay, I'll... before you squeeze your question, let me just comment on, on, on Ms., uh, Dr. Nendez's um, comment, which is, um, and I, uh, uh, I think, uh, Heath Einstein and others in the missions are talking about, um, you know, calibrating, you know, this idea of SAT as a requirement. But you're right. I mean, I, I think that the part of the reason why we do it is because we've always done it, right? And SAT does measure, but the question is measure what? It most likely measures socioeconomic status, right? I mean, it's not to say it doesn't measure any intelligence at all. I mean, in terms of people who get high scores not having any ability to uh, succeed in college. But at the same time, it's a, it's a blunt instrument. It does not measure um, you know, the, the, the grit, the perseverance, and the wherewithal, the multitasking, that, that other people, you know, the other skills that many people may have that just aren't measured in this one way. I mean, just even when you think about who starts talking about the SAT, how us SAT is a, is a culture, it's an expectation, and just even the preparation um, or the assistance whether it be you know thousands of dollars for prep courses or whatever the case, you know, or it's already part of the curriculum within a private school, you know, these sorts of deals, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, not to say that it doesn't measure anything, but to make it the only measure, that would be the travesty. Ms. Perkins, uh, why don't you go on in, brother? And also uh, at the end, you just give a shout out to the, the podcast situation. Absolutely, uh, Dr. Hernandez. Um, just a very quick question. Um, I see that in our participants, we have a lot of our uh, white co-conspirators and allies here on campus. Mm -hmm. uh, what what uh, recommendations would you give to them and how they might be able to interrupt whiteness as a white person um, in the higher education in the academy? 30 seconds. Uh, listen, to listen to folks like us, um, to um, be humble. I mean, we could all stand to be humble and um, our limited forms of knowledge and to truly advocate in everything that we do and to push back in the ways that we as people of color are not as able to push back and to act to be an ally is an active process. Thank you. Um, so in, in, in closing, and I'll just hand it back to Dr. E, Dr. Hernandez, I thank you so much for your time, energy, and effort. Uh, I have a notepad full of notes as someone who is an aspiring uh, PhD student one day that wants to follow in these same uh, footsteps, I appreciate uh, what was shared for us today. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, for our audience, I also want to uh, recommend and point you into the direction of our podcast uh, titled Reconcile This. It can be found on any streaming services, Apple, Spotify, and Google, uh, whereas co-host Dr. G and myself are talking to the champions on campus, those people that every day are doing the work of reconciliation and healing. Uh, these episodes come out every two weeks with bonus, bonus content found within between. Uh, we hope that you may, you know, find some time to listen to five, 10, or even the whole episode. Uh, we, we're, we're talking to these people who are doing the work, their voices and stories should be heard. And it's just a good way for us to build a uh, constant community. Uh, with that being said, I will hand the mic back to Dr. G. Thank you, Ms. Perkins. And most of all, thank you, Dr. Hernandez. Well, both Dr. Hernandez, but most especially to you, Dr. Este Hernandez, for coming to the space speaking your truth to power and showing us that you have the dopest pendientes in the game. <laughs> thank you. In translation, we're talking about the earrings, right? Oh, the, thank got, you. Got the, got the beer hand on fleet there. So we appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you. And um, lastly, uh, party people, for all those uh, listening uh, to this presentation, the bottom line is this is just one more step on our pathway as we proceed down the path towards reconciliation. I cannot promise what will happen as a result of a race and reconciliation initiative, but I can pledge to you that we are doing the best we can with what we have. Amen. Thank you all so much. <laughs>